Well, today is a special day, and and I'm scanning the crowd, and we've got two out of three, and Meatloaf said two out of three is not bad. <laughs> we'll get to enjoy that specialness apparently again next week. Uh, uh, we are installing and ordaining elders today uh, to serve a new term, and I'm looking, and I know Chad is here, and Richard is here, and we don't want Randy anywhere near any of us because Randy's had the flu all week. And uh, so I am glad he stayed home and pray that we all learn from Randy. If we're sick and have fever and lots of germs, that we too will stay home because the Lord will function just fine without us. So at this time, I'm going to invite Richard and Chad, if you would, come forward. And uh, we'll do this as proper and yet as brief as we can. Um, here, I'll come down here. They they look at me all the time. Uh, Richard and Chad, as well as Randy, were elected to new terms to serve as elders on the church session. Uh, Richard and Randy have previously served as elders, and uh, so uh, they don't need to be uh, ordained to the position. Chad, however, has not, and so today uh, we do that. Uh, to begin, I get to ask a couple of questions, and uh, hopefully you'll answer more vocally than we've, as a group, answered the other questions this morning. Uh, but the first couple of questions, Chad, are just addressed to you, and, and so I'll start with you, and then I'll invite Richard to join in later. Okay. Chad, do you believe the Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the inspired Word of God, the authority for faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church as containing the essential doctrines taught in the Holy Scripture? Do you approve of and promise to uphold the government of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church? And do you promise to promote the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Richard, now would you join in? In participating as an elder in the judicatories of the church, do you both promise to share in a responsible way in the decisions that are made, to abide by those decisions, and to promote the welfare of the church? And do you accept the office of elder in this church and promise faithfully to discharge all the duties thereof as God may enable you to do so? Church, we get to ask you a question. Do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive these elders, and do you promise to give them such encouragement, support, and respect as belong to the office? Church, do you? Then at this time, I am going to declare... No, I'm not. I'm not declaring anything just yet. I'm going to invite all of the current and former elders who have served on the church to come forward. Uh, that we might uh, have a, a laying on of hands of prayer for Chad, uh, as well as for Richard at this time. Elders, would you come at this time, please? And I'm just going to invite you two to kneel right here if you're able. Forget to add. Elders, if you can just gather around, place a hand on them, that would be great. I'm going to ask the rest of you to do me a favor as well. If you would stand and just raise a hand in this general direction, uh, that we might pray a, a prayer of blessing over these. May we pray. Our God and our Father, today we are grateful for uh, those who are willing to serve. God, we're grateful for those who step into positions of leadership to do that. And we pray that uh, for Chad today, Lord, that you would set him apart to your service. Uh, God, that uh, for he and Richard both, as they come together with the other elders on the session, God, that you would work through their brains, their hands, their efforts, uh, their hearts uh, to, to build up your church uh, and to build up your kingdom here in our community. God, we pray that you would strengthen them with your spirit, that you would equip them with knowledge, uh, that you would fill them with compassion, uh, that they might fulfill the duties to which they have agreed. God, we are thankful for them today. Uh, This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you all stand, you may exchange uh, greetings with one another. 
And I will now declare that Richard and Chad, you have been regularly elected and ordained according to the government of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What I'll do is at the conclusion of the service, Richard, if you and Chad wouldn't mind standing out there and letting people greet you and welcome you, that would be a wonderful thing. You may have a seat. And I'll let the rest of you be seated as well. I started to panic this morning because at this point I'm supposed to give a charge to not only the elders but to the church. And, and uh, I'll be honest, I hadn't seen Richard, Chad, or Randy, and I didn't know how I was going to make this charge uh, apply to us if we did not have elders to ordain and install. Uh, so I did a quick trial sermon with the high school kids upstairs, and they were thrilled. So I, I'm glad that we don't have to go that route this morning. Uh, but I, I do want to bring two little messages this morning. One to our elders of the session. Uh, Paul in his letter to Timothy is very clear uh, he lays out very clearly what it is Timothy should be looking for when he's looking for leaders in the church. And, and what he tells Timothy, I think, is an important thing for us to pay attention to today. Uh, it's from 1 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul writes, Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach and the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect, for if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil." This one must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Wow. What uh, a list uh, of character traits that uh, uh, Paul lays out for leaders in the church. It's definitely not the passage that uh, I used when I went and approached those about serving uh, as an elder. Uh, but I, I, I'm glad to report that these that we installed today are well aware of what God expects of them. And, and they're well aware uh, of, of how far short they come uh, to those expectations. They understand the meaning uh, of words like humility, and servanthood, and selflessness. And I think it's safe to say that for us as a church, the leadership of our church remains in good hands with those who are well aware that their ability to lead comes only from God. So to our elders today, the message I share with you is from the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 3. He says, Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Elders, God's word for us today is this. Live up to what you have already attained. Or, or, or better yet, uh, be who God has made you to be. And allow God to use you in that way. God doesn't make us all great with numbers. God doesn't make us all great with people. God doesn't make us all great with serving. God doesn't make us all great with, with anything. We're, we're all different. Be who God made you to be. I still am astonished that God made me the way I am and then called me to do what I do. I remember as a kid growing up, when I first started this ministry, I looked at other people who I loved and respected. And I looked at people who I thought would be the perfect role model for me to follow after. And if I could only be just like them, I'd have it right and I'd have it made. I'm thinking about uh, maybe some of you know Pastor Paul Hancock. If I could only be cool like him, because he was cool, but but I wasn't. If I could only be like like Todd or, or Lewis Brenton, those two guys had the one of the greatest ways of uh, of preaching the gospel ever. If I could just be like them, I'd be successful. 
And, and, and I don't know, does any of you remember Lewis? He had hair down to about here and he was wild and abrasive and sometimes kind of abusive and he thought he was a ninja. I wanted to be a ninja too. But here's the deal. I, the, the first time that this, this point made its way home to me, I had gone to a church camp to be the pastor for the week and, and my whole goal was to be Lewis Brenton and preach like Lewis. Well, only Lewis can do that. I can't. And I failed miserably. It was the worst couple of sermons. Well, up until that point, the worst couple of sermons I ever preached in my life. Because I wasn't being who God made me to be. God made me a smart aleck. And I finally am aware of that. It took me a while. He gave me a sense of humor that He didn't give to some other people. And He gave me the ability to relate with people that not everybody has. And, and once I figured out that I'm supposed to be who God made me, I, I became free and was not burdened by the task that was before me. Elders, be who God made you to be. Don't try to be somebody else. We can't do it. We weren't made for that. God specifically made us to be who we are for a reason so that His light, as it shines through our different personalities and our different abilities and our different character traits, it kind of takes on the the appearance of a big stained glass window. If all the colors in a stained glass window were blue, we'd just have a big blue window. If they were all yellow, it'd just be a big yellow window. But when they're all different, What a beautiful picture that makes. And that's what what God calls each of us to do. is to be who He made us to be. You know, God knew what He was doing when He made you. He knew what He was doing when He made the person next to you. Look at them. Look at the people on either side of you. I know. Come on, it's okay to laugh. But when He made them... He made them with purpose. He made them the way they are for a reason. Elders, if we can be ourselves, if we can be who God made us, our task as elder, we're told, is to allow the grace of God to transform you into what He is already and is in the process of making you through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If you can present yourself as a living sacrifice in this manner, you will not be able to leave undone the tasks that are set before you. The opposite is also true. Apart from the grace of God, you are unable to live the life and perform the duties of the office to which you now hold. That's why Jesus told His closest disciples, remain in Me, I in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in Me. Elders, I encourage you today with the command of Jesus to go and bear much fruit. Now the second part of this message that I want to bring is more directed to the congregation, though I think it's great advice for all of us to be who God made us to be. It's more than just a day for us to look at the office of elder and those who hold it, the many requirements that go with it. It's... uh, a day for us to look at our role and our responsibility to those who provide leadership to us. If we go back to Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul gives instruction to teach his congregation how they are to treat those in positions of leadership over them. Chapter 2, he writes, I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful, quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. We are to pray, request, intercede, and offer thanksgiving for all of those in positions of leadership. I think we could go a whole global leaders moment here, but I won't. What Paul is telling Timothy in the moment is that the folks in the church are to pray for their leaders. They're to encourage their leaders and they're to submit to their leaders. 
Uh, spiritual leadership is possible only in the strength of God's Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is dispersed, or God's Spirit is distributed, or God's Spirit is unleashed through the prayers of His people. According to Paul, it's the responsibility of those under leadership to pray and intercede on behalf of those who are in places of leadership over them. Church, it's your responsibility to pray for your elders. Not only do they hear from you when things are going right, they also need to hear and receive your support, for they can't function without it. Uh, the, the greatest illustration I think of this is, is my grandma, when she was still alive, prayed for me all the time. And she told me, she prayed for me especially on Wednesday nights when I would be leading youth meetings, and on Sunday mornings when I would be doing things leading in the church. And any other time that we had a retreat or there was a camp, I knew that she was praying for me. And I remember she passed away right at the start of summer. And and the day after her funeral, I was supposed to start a church camp. And we got done and we drove to Elizabethtown, Kentucky, to the worst church camp in the history of America. Everything is either at the top of a mountain or the bottom of a mountain. And there's nothing in between. And whoever planned the schedule never saw the place, and you went from here to there, here to there. And we walked the whole time. But I remember showing up to speak and feeling... I, I, I mean, I was sad and all of that, but I just felt weak. Because I knew she was the one person who I could always count on to be praying for me in times of ministry. And without her... I was, I was inefficient for the job. Well, I've since then figured out how to get beyond that, but, but what I'm suggesting is that for our elders, they are strengthened and empowered to do the job they do by the prayers that we're willing to pray on their behalf. I think sometimes we forget that. It's no easy job being an elder, especially when, when, when they're trying to step out in faith and lead the church forward with, with, with a plan that involves money that we haven't yet seen. When we ask them to go into the hospital, even though they're terrified and trembling, and visit with folks that they don't really know too well. It's a difficult job, and they cannot do it without the Spirit of God. So we, we have to pray for them first. We have to encourage them was the second point that, that uh, we pulled out of that passage. And, and basically, uh, I mean, when everything's going great, not much is said. When something's not going the way it ought to be, boy, it doesn't take long for every elder in the church to know about it, right? And that's okay. But how about when things are going great? They hear from you too. You guys are doing a great job. I know you guys do a thankless job. I know you don't get a nickel for what you're doing and you spend hours and hours and hours doing it. Thanks for your sacrifice. Thanks for the gift of your time. Thanks for being willing to do what you do. And, and, and I know every one of them, minus the ladies, of course, they love to eat a lot. Take them cookies to work. Take them cookies to the meeting. If you want to do that, then I get in on it. Take them out to lunch. Do, do something to let them know that you appreciate what they do because it is, uh, like I said, a difficult job. And, and I, I think about, I'm, I'm married to a cheerleading coach. And, and it'll, I have a little cheerleader. She's so cute. But she's giving me this. But I know we've been to some ball games where it's been pretty close. And, and the game was decided by just a few points. And, and those games that we won, a lot of times it was because the cheerleaders got the crowd excited and the, the crowd got the team excited and, and, and the team got... And they win. And, and I, we're so good at that with sporting stuff. But what about with church? Wouldn't it be great if we could treat people that way? Or even just encouragement in general when we saw people struggle, when we saw people having a difficult time, rather than just kind of step away because we're not sure what to say. Come on, we're all guilty. Why don't we just step in a little closer and say, hey, I'm not exactly sure what to say. 
But I want you to know I'm here and I'm behind you and I'm pushing you all the way. And we're going to do this. You can do this. That's what our elders need. But that, heck, that's what we all need, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if we had that? We wake. And then finally, the, this third point was to submit. Um, there's something about our elders, and we share it every year, and I'll never get tired of sharing it. Um, the authority of spiritual leadership comes not from those who gather around the session table, but from the very heart of God. Our submission to the leadership of those over us is really a reflection of our submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and His claim on our lives. Submission is not something that comes natural, something that comes easy. I know the kids have had each other down on the floor and Bailey will have Hunter by the neck and she'll say, say uncle, say uncle, and he's not going to say it, no matter what. That's a made-up story. <laughs> I, have, I have license with that. But, but we're not, as people, as humans, submitting to authority or submitting to anything is not something that comes natural. It's something that we have to work at. And and in the church, I think it's no different. Uh, We must rely on the Lord Jesus to exercise His will through the leadership of those He's chosen to guide His church. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree, right? But it does mean that we'll accept the decisions and directions as God's Word for us at this point in time. I don't know how many of you ever... I've only been in one really bad session meeting and it wasn't here. And I saw two grown men, in the name of Jesus, grab each other by the shirt collars across the table and we're going to beat each other up. And I wanted to see it. No, <laughs> I mean, kind of. But, but what I've noticed with our elders here, and we start the year with this and we carry it throughout the entire year, whether we agree or not, At the end of the meeting, we leave in one accord. Whether we got our way or whether we didn't get our way, we respect one another and ultimately we respect the Lord to say that I'm not getting my way, but I'm content to trust God to work it out. That is the nature and the character of the elders of your church. And I hope that becomes one of the things that becomes more contagious in the days that follow. Apparently anymore, you can't disagree and still like people. You can't disagree and still be friends. America's blowing up because of that. Uh, Maybe we in the church can teach that it's possible to be united and still not be in total agreement with everything. We do agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that's what it takes. Uh, The Confession of Faith... As I conclude, section 2.73 shares some pretty powerful words that I close with today. I think I close with these words every time we have one of these services. It says, Elders share in the same vocation that belongs to all Christians to be witnesses to the Gospel. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're an elder, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, whether you're a genius or not, Whatever you are in the kingdom of Christ, you are and have and will continue to have a responsibility to be a witness to the good news of Jesus. We have the responsibility to testify on behalf of the goodness of Christ. And we can't just pawn it off on the elders or we can't just pawn it off on the preacher. We all share that. kind of goes with last week's message. We have a responsibility to share the hope that we have. Again from Paul to Timothy, you man of God, flee from all of this, and he talks about a long list of of things that uh, I don't wish to go into this morning. He says, flee from that and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in His own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, 
the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to Him be honor and glory and might forever. Amen. Regardless of our role in the church, to Him be glory and honor and might forever and ever. Amen.